Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. I love that introduction. How are you going, everyone? Uh, welcome to Investing Insights with Right Property Group. I am Philip Tarrant. I'm a co-host of this podcast and I'm joined by my regular partners in crime, Victor Kumar and Steve Waters. They're directors at the Right Property Group. We get together once a month to have a bit of chat about what's going on in property and hopefully give you some information to help you be me more informed property investors. Gentlemen, how are you going? You well? I'm good, Phil. Awesome. Thank you for asking. Awesome. It's a big word for it's you. Be- it's better than well. It's yes, just it is. fantastic. Yeah. Why are you so awesome for? I'm not awesome. I just feel awesome. I know. That's what I mean. Right. Thanks. Why do you feel so awesome? I don't know. You're alive. Yeah. Kicking. Sunny day. Yeah, sort of. It rained all last night, but- uh, It's a half glass empty kind of guy you are. Someone who's be pe- pessimist in this market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be one of a gazillion. No, I'm not actually. I'm one of the uh, the optimists in this, uh, this market, and I think you guys probably share my sentiments around it. Uh, Victor, I think um, the conversations I've had with you over many, 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 many years, uh, you know, your beacon towards sensibility mainly is around this is very, very normal what's happening right now. And you've always said, no matter what the market, this is very, very normal right now. So it is very, very normal right now, it isn't is it? It is absolutely normal. It's just normal cycles doing what it does in property. Uh, and if you if you trace it all the way back since we kept data, it's been exactly the same. You've just got different factors playing in, but the cycle remains the same. We get um, buoyant on the property market. We we build a lot more. We buy a lot more. We, we have that wealth effect where we feel wealthy because our equity is increasing. Uh, and then it slows down and all of a sudden we don't feel as wealthy. We stop spending. Cycle starts all over again. So th- this tweet literally came into my telephone device here uh, moments before walking into the studio. And it's from Shane Oliver. Shane Oliver, uh, if you don't know, is AMP's chief economist. Mm-hmm. He's been, been in that, that role for, for many, many years. And he wrote, and maybe this is something to help shape our chat today, but uh, it says, over the last 20 years, Australian capital city average prices, house prices, sorry, have risen 7% per annum, which means they double every 10 years. Over the last 10 years, it was 5% per annum, which means that they double every 14 years. And then the sort of question is, or thesis is, if it's 3% per annum over the next decade, it would take 24 years to double. So this is talking about the market right now. And if, if we have price growth, a 3% growth in a period ahead, that means it's going to take 24 years for property to double. Now, one of the myths in property investment is that, you know, property doubles every 7 to 10 or 12 That's or 30. Right. Well, I don't know who you listen to, right? And you guys have always gone, yeah, it's not really how it works. No, um, it isn't how it works. If you if you bet the bank on doubling every seven years, it puts you in a very dangerous position. But then there are probably instances and there will be instances where it may take 24 years for something uh, to double at 3% price growth. But that doesn't mean – that's a general statement. There, there, as we always say and everybody else says, there's markets within markets and, and, and we're so talking on. average numbers. We're talking average numbers. Uh, well, well average you're not talking average numbers. I think you're talking average investors yes. is what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, the, the reason why you guys have a business are in business because you help investors be better than average investors, right, by mm. helping shape the way in which they approach investing in property and find them the properties that aren't going to grow at 3% annualised and I look at the portfolio that you've helped me build, I can't think of any properties that have only grown at 3%. I think I was complaining once when they weren't when they didn't going double up by two years. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I still complain about it. But, um, but you know, I, I saw that tweet and I thought, you know, it might be a good way to help shape a bit of our conversation today. And, and we only get together once a month and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of frequent but it's sort of infrequent. But, you know, in a month things have changed a lot mm-hmm. since we last got together. So I thought maybe um, a bit of a discussion around investing against the trend, you know, um, you know, you just got to pick up a paper now and, and, and it's done to death and we've spoken about it and, and see the negativity in, in property markets. But to me, I see opportunity. Glass half full, um, not half empty. Nice to um, see. So, yeah, I, I think if we can help instill some mindset shifts of people's brains about turning negativity into positivity and look for the opportunities rather than the, than the challenges in a market, I think we'll be doing pretty well. So if you don't mind, I'd like to cover that off today if that's all right. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like a plan. All right. Well, you can start then, Victor. Give me something good, quick, one well, minute. If you look at the biggest markets in, in Australia, which is Sydney and Melbourne, right? So if you look at it from, from uh, year on year uh, as of this month, actually, sorry, February, Melbourne had 34% more listings, uh, new listings come on compared to same time last year. And uh, Sydney has had 24% more listings um, come on. Um, so what it's, what it's done is sent a clear change in the cycle where it's tipped from a uh, seller's market 
into a buyer's market because there's more properties on the market. There's less buyers in the market right now. And the reason why there's less market is we, uh, less buyers in the market is that we've got several factors playing in. The main factor being finance uh, or the inability to get finance. Uh, and then you've also got uh, overlaid on that the general market sentiment, people waiting to see what the federal and state elections are going to bring in, into play. The uh, general sentiment globally at the moment where every, everyone seems to be talking doom and gloom. Uh, but this is where a good property investor, someone that's got a good solid plan that is medium to long term, this is the day of reckoning where they can come in, they can they can absolutely um, build up a good baseline and, and purchase opportunistic properties without having to battle it through with multiple buyers trying to push the price up. As, as Steve, uh, you and I would say, it's taken the giggle money out of the market. So day of reckoning. Day of reckoning. Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big call, <laughs> <Yeah>. Vic. <laughs> so we're going from investing against the trend to a day of reckoning. Well, we've gone right. from Armageddon <laughs> to that. Is it Armageddon? It's not Armageddon, No, is it's it? not Armageddon. No. It's not Armageddon. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 sorry, yeah, it, it is Armageddon for someone that's not prepared, someone yeah. that has not seen this market or someone who hasn't got the right advice around this uh, and, and someone that's investing purely out of media research. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm talking general media, not not obviously uh, us, where we are, we are more education-based. Every article that you see is talking about how much the property prices have dropped, how hard the market has become, uh, the stats of Melbourne and Sydney having so many more properties on the market. And if we are investing using those metrics, of course we'll be in trouble. Mm. But if we use those metrics to change the way we're investing and, and realign the types of properties we're buying, what we're buying, where we're buying, this is the time to make money. So I was watching uh, a thing on the interweb the other day. I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to, um, what's his name, Gary Vanderchuk. Um, Gary V. The Gary V uh, show or whatever it is anyway. Uh, but it was a video of him chatting with, um, with someone, Tom Panos actually. And he spoke about, and this just got me thinking about this, he spoke about he views himself and what he does for, uh, does for a living, he's, he views himself as a wartime general. So a general in wartime, it's not a good time, right? If you're fighting in a war, things aren't good, right? Mm. But what wars do and what wartime generals do, there's winners and there's losers. So he framed that into the business context that he operates within in that he loves it when things are hard because it means that not everyone is winning. So it means there are losers. As long as not you, you're the winner, you're okay. So you put that into the current context of the property market. When markets are going up, everyone's winning. It's easy to win, right? You know, when things are hard, when, when things are tough, when, when, when your back's against the wall, when things aren't in your favour, it's where you fight harder and it's harder to win. But when you win, the prizes are a lot bigger. And those those battles come in with good strategic planning. And that's absolutely, what it down to. absolutely. So, you know, it's a tough market right now for property. We're talking Sydney and Melbourne in particular, but, you know, Brizzy's starting to get a bit tighter. Tasmania is still flying along. It's softened a lot. But, you know, keeping in context to um, uh, Sydney and, and Melbourne, it's hard to win in property right now, but if you get it right, you win big. And this goes about investing against the trend. So the trend is everyone is going, shit, I'm selling my properties because properties are going south and I need to cash out before I lose all my dough. Those investors that are investing against the trend are saying, this is the time to strike. This is it. What, what did you, you call it? This is the, the, the day, day of reckoning, the hour of reckoning. The day of reckoning. Of reckoning. Right. I can you just know. see the headline of this podcast now. <laughs> but which, and, and I like that context. So how do you win in this market then? It, it means you, you've got to take more risks when, when there's more challenges, right? No. Uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree. think there's more risk. Yeah. I think there's less risk in today's market than what there is Excellent. two Happy three years ago. That. Yeah. Because two to three years ago, you were if you were buying Sydney, you were somewhere near the top of the cycle. And I would dare say that the people are selling out of Sydney now, therefore – going back to your stat, more properties on the market, are the people that did buy at the top of the cycle is version one, version two are the people that didn't prepare themselves for falling off the, the cliff of interest only. Mm -hmm. uh, or version three is just because it's in their head now, I'm going to get out before, I, yeah, before yeah. I do lose 50% because that's what the media tells me. But What, what was the phrase you, you uh, coined? Fongo, wasn't it? Fongo. Yeah. Fongo. Fongo. Well, there's FOMO, fear of missing out, and Fongo. Take a guess. Fear of not missing out. Fear of not getting out. Uh, okay. okay. Do you like that? Fongo. Fongo. So you're telling me that it's less risky to invest in a softening market than what it is in a market that's so. at its peak? I think so. So that's investing against the trend. That mindset. Well, it people, is. People have got to flick a switch to think that yeah. way, I reckon. Yeah, exactly. But there's a couple yeah. of reasons why. One of them is because if we look at today's finance environment, money's still very cheap. Well, so it's, it, it's been cheapest in, in terms of variable rates. It's the 
It's cheaper since 1960. And it's easy to get now. I hear um, ANZ is it's yeah. easier than what it was maybe a year ago. ANZ's lifted its LVRs and stuff, you know. you can get- Well, on its interest-only loans, but yeah. you've still got a service. And the you cal- do. The calcs are still tight. But mm. the if if we go back to the GFC, which was a different um, set of circumstances, but let's just take consumer confidence as the same metric. Yeah. How good was that for us back then? Absolutely. Like that, it, was, it was awesome because you were going against the trend, as you coined, and actually, it wasn't too much longer than you started after the end of the GFC. It was, mm. There was still negative consumer confidence, but because there's not as many people in the market, you have more choice. You can negotiate a little harder. Uh, you overlay that with the fact that finance is hard to get in today's market. Then there are certain types of properties that have certain trigger points on whether you should invest in them or not. And that's just taking aside the fundamentals, of and, course. And as well. if you look at uh, our uh, listen to our earlier podcast, one of the things we've been saying consistently throughout all of the podcasts is have your money ready before you need it. And this that's is the key. Yeah, this is the this time is the where where it will pay dividends because if you're already set up in terms of finances, your lines of credit, you've all uh, already looked after your borrowing capacity. This is the time to actually uh, come in and come in hard in markets that have got good fundamentals, where the sentiment isn't quite there yet for the general investor, so the so the first time investors or, or investors that are not as well guided, or equally importantly, investors that have focused on tax reasons to invest rather than wealth reasons. Yeah, and they're in a world uh, of hurt. And, and, mm, and yeah. they will be in a world of, world of hurt. And um, this is where fundamentals come back into play. Well, let's overlay this Gary V because you brought him up. So in this particular- Did you listen to his stuff, Gary V? I, I, on and off yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, it gets a little bit tiresome for me, but mm. yeah, there's some good stuff in it. But in this circumstance, he would say, well, I want to be a winner, not a loser. I'm playing the long game, secondly, mm-hmm. and I'm able to execute opportunities- when they arise because I'm prepared. And we've been saying for a gazillion years now that liquidity is the key in property. Always be liquid so that you can execute opportunities via offsets or or lines of credits, whatever it may be. Mm. And to give you an example about going off or against the trend, being prepared, being liquid, so to speak. So we bought a property two weeks ago in Sydney at auction for three on 600 and- 634 squares. 634 squares. Just a standard brick house, brick and weatherboard, for three hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars. They don't exist. True story. Where was it? South southwest. 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 Okay, so <laughs> you give me a catchment area about two million people live. That's all right. You're a journal. Yeah. You'll work it out. <laughs> it's, um, but so, but that's against the trend. But now, if we were to rely simply on, I'm going to talk about auction clearance rates here because it was an auction. Mm. And if you look at the general auction clearance rate across the whole of Sydney, it's quite poor. It's getting a little better, but it's, yeah. what is it, 50% or something like that? Yeah, 50, I think they shifted about 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, yeah. 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 And, the, and the general barometer of a healthy market according to the auction stats is around about 60%. Mm. At this particular auction, there was five or six properties up for sale mm-hmm. and all but one sold. So if I was relying on that stat in terms of an auction clearance rate, well, I'd say it's a really healthy yeah. market. It's not that it's healthy, it's just that the sophisticated investor sees opportunity there. They believe there's value there. Was that just buyers execute. agents there bidding against each other for these things or would you get some punters in there as well? No, there, no, was, there was some punters there. Yeah. There were some yeah. punters, but they were sophisticated punters mm-hmm. and I keep using that punter, word. Punter being a term of demon, I like the term <laughs> punter. I'm a punter, so, <laughs> yeah. you know. But they were, yeah. they, were, they were clued up Yeah, yeah. and they were prepared. And mm-hmm. this particular house needed a little bit of love. Mm. It needed some paint some, and some flooring. and some 10, 15 grand's worth. Oh, not Thir- more than 15, yeah. they Yeah, say. 13, the quote yeah. came in the other okay. day. So at 388 plus 13... It's not a you could you couldn't buy a block of land for that in Sydney. So the the, the client that you purchase this property for it are they sort of quite a way down through their investment journey? They are, and that's yeah. the that's the point. So they've got uh, ample exposure in Victoria. They've got ample exposure in Brisbane, uh, and Sydney was the next choice for them. Yeah. But being quite opportunistic to fit that or that property had a certain reason to be in that mm. portfolio. So yeah. I think it's important to point out here that Sydney market, Melbourne market would not suit every investor. No. It comes back to the financials. It comes back to the ability to hold onto the uh, property and also uh, where the rest of the portfolio is. So if the, is the baseline done? Are they starting out today? Is this the first property? Is and their cash flow yeah. scenario able to support a property in Sydney or Melbourne with its lower yields? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question for you guys is, um, you know, we're talking about investing against the trend. So people are probably listening to this going, don't you guys know what's going on? You're a pack of idiots. 
property is going to lose 40 to 50 percent of its value and you're out there saying investing property is a good idea so in two three years time when we're all sitting on a park bench feeding pigeons drinking long necks because we are all out of a because we're all out of a job i just, I just had that visual <laughs> they reckon with podcasts you got to paint paint these pictures right so yeah imagine three guys at a park bench talking about oh remember all that property we used to own and and, and now we're now we're destitute and homeless and uh you know, are people going to go, we told you so, or they're going to be going, oh. Are God, they racing what, what? pigeons though? I don't want normal <laughs> pigeons. <laughs> why, why, didn't we, why didn't we listen to you guys back then when you're saying it's okay to be investing in property right now because this is when you can actually create a lot of wealth? Are we right? Are we wrong? How do we stress test this? Or you guys have just been around long enough and seen these markets to know that stay the course. Look, for me. Fuck the trend. It's, I don't even think it's – well, it's, it's – Bucking the, the current trend, mm. or oh, we're making too much of this. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, that's a, it's a relevant conversation to even have, and just say this is the market. If you're a smart investor, you invest. When- I think both sides. I think yeah. there's, you know, there's there's too much of yeah. You should get into the market. You should buy Sydney. You should buy Melbourne. You should buy Brisbane, Adelaide, or wherever. Mm. Um, but there's also too much of well, you you know the, the market's going to crash by fifty percent. You shouldn't do this. You should all put it into shares or, or keep it in the bank, buy yeah. gold, whatever it may be. And there's a little bit of um, both sides are, are right there because investing isn't for everybody. Investing in today's market isn't for everybody. Uh, and there probably will be areas that have lost, that will lose 30, 40%, the, the incorrect fundamentally, fundamental areas. But to each their own, if, if property is your thing or if you're entertaining property or some other investment vehicle, then get to know it. Make sure that you've got your buffers in place and your risk mitigation in place. And either do it or don't. So, so you say this market isn't right for everyone. Who is it right for? Like, if you're going to invest in Sydney, Victor, who should be investing in Sydney right now? And that's a broad statement. And again, this is not advice in any way. Mm-hmm. Just a quick disclaimer. Blah 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 blah. Listen to it at the end of it. But this is just general knowledge. Who should be investing in Sydney? Well, it's someone that can afford the negative cash flow, right? Because Sydney Sydney prices and the uh, um, so property prices and the rents are out of out of sync at the moment. Mm. So generally, what happens uh, in, in terms of the market turning into a buoyant market is when the rents catch up. Yeah. So the important thing that that we need to understand that in Sydney, let's let let's play this out. So let's say the market crashed another twenty percent, right? And I use the word crash deliberately. Uh, let's say it did crash another twenty percent. For someone that can afford to hold on to their property, uh, in other words, not suffer from uh, lack of cash flow, even if there is a new government and they have tinkered with the negative gearing and the negative gearing goes away completely, so they're, they're operating totally cash in, cash out. Mm. If someone can hold on, they will be in a far better position a couple of years down the track because the flow in effect is that when markets dampen, you get people that uh, stop spending. So discretionary spending stops, the wealth effect comes into play. Uh, You get people that uh, were going to buy, they stop uh, their purchase. People that were skating uh, on the red line, they will sell. And you'll find that there are far more sellers out there than buyers. And the net effect is that people will start renting, people will start contracting back home from the office, office environment and so forth, and your rent start increasing. Well, so, play, play that out a bit further. It's a natural cycle, right? Natural cycle. It is yeah. natural because yeah. what happens, and look at today, building approvals are falling off mm-hmm. the other side of the cliff, so they're stopping dead. Yes, we still have an oversupply in units and that that's those that are also in the construction Natural phase. cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, natural cycle. And because the developers can't get pre-sales because they can't get finance, that vicious circle, so to speak, yep. spins. And so what happens is the low yields that we get today will eventually equalise and then eventually get to a stage where – they're good yields because demand exceeds supply. That's the natural cycle. So by if Sydney, if you're if you're amply ready mm. to invest in Sydney, well then consider it. But there's yeah. also Melbourne, same scenario. That's Although right. it's probably same six scenario. months yeah. behind six months behind. Yeah. behind Sydney in terms of its price slide. And then there are also other areas. Mm. You know, this WA one could maybe put that into the same boat as well. But the difference between perhaps Sydney and WA or Brisbane or Adelaide or or Melbourne for that matter, is that we are boxed in. Sydney is boxed in. We've got national parks, sea and mountains, whereas all the other states have that open field where they can keep expanding, expanding, Mm. expanding. And whilst we have an oversupply here at the moment, especially units in Mm -hmm. certain areas, let's not forget that Sydney is the immigration magnet to Australia and it will always be that way. So the supply will absorb sooner or later. Mm. So hold the course. 
keep connected, know your cash position, mm-hmm. don't sell if you don't need to, and look for opportunities. And, and you mentioned it now a couple of times, Victor, you've spoken about a seller's market and a buyer's market. So we are in, we've moving, we've moved into and are currently in a buyer's market. Correct. Is it better as a property investor to be active in a buyer's market than a seller's market? Look, you, there's opportunities in both markets. Okay. So you just need to realign to the types of properties you, you're buying and the negotiation tactics that you're using uh, in, in, in both markets. In a buyer's market, which is today, uh, you've got a larger array of property selections. You've got less people competing against you. And especially if you are finance ready, you are far ahead of the competition. Well, let's explore that. So because there's more properties on the market and because finance is harder to mm. get and properties are taking longer to sell, just the way that you'd negotiate, as you say, would be... It's different. ...would be different. And a, and a good example of that would be the cooling off period if we're talking about Sydney specific. Yep. So before you were lucky to get five days, now you can push it probably to 10 with some mm. negotiation. Uh, sorry, and, just stop. I'll stop you there. Can you please explain that? I don't think people might have missed that. Uh, so the so cooling, cooling off, off period, yeah. So the cooling off period when you sign a contract, there's a, there's a cooling off period for, for New South Wales. And it's usually around about five days where you can rescind the contract and yeah. just probably lose your 0.25. <clears throat> mm. And in a hot market or in a market that's that's selling very quickly, often the agents would play that and try and even reduce that cooling off period. Or they may not even put it in a contract and say yeah. whoever exchanges yeah. unconditionally yeah. first. Yeah. So, so from, from a tactical perspective then, you can negotiate number one on cooling off period and number Correct. two, you can use that period of time up to 10 days, maybe longer if you're smart. To, to use to be able to control a property if you need to get some and other stuff. And cross the T's, dot the I's, a little bit more diligence, pest and buildings, valuations, yep. all that sort of good stuff. And so, even- so you can go into, you can go, yeah, I'll buy it, sign a contract, 0.25, and you've got 10 days to get out of it. That's when you can actually really. Yeah, but there is a cost of business there being the 0.25 of the, or 0.25% of the purchase price, which yeah. you will lose. Um, and some people would say that's a cost of business, but it's not just on the. That's a private treaty sale, but even mm. the way that you would handle yourself at an auction mm-hmm. is completely different today than what it was two years ago. We'll get on that in a sec. Sorry to interrupt you beforehand. I can't remember what your line of thought was, but I'll probably throw it in the mix. I don't know. You've, you've lost me. You've- All right, let's talk about negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to the, the 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 discussion was around sellers markets, buyers market. Yep. Is it better be a, an investor in a buyers market? You said. Depends. Opportunities on both. Opportunities on both. That's yep. cool. So, so we're in a buyer's market right now. Correct. Is it is it a hot buyer's market or is it a no, building up to be starting to building up to be? I up I'd, to be. I'd probably look at it a little bit differently. I think it's a buyer's market for around about five percent of people. That five okay. percent. That five percent that know that. And I'm not talking just Sydney here. I'm talking anywhere. Those people that want to buy and that are educated enough and know how to buy, whether that be the right team around them, and or know what, what they're buying, and know what they're buying and what the end product is. Uh, or how it fits into their portfolio mm-hmm. is about five percent of the market, and and we're trying to do as much as we can in this window of opportunity. And then there's ninety five percent of the market that will sit on their hands, whether it be because of the federal state elections and the uncertainty, the market in flux, the media, mm. and they might eventually so do something. That 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 for five percent of the market you're talking about are the people who are investing against the trend. Correct. Because number one, yeah. they have the mindset to do it. Number two, they've got the capacity to do it. Yeah, they're probably the two things you need: the willingness. Okay, a lot of people go, yeah, I want to be that person, but then they go, oh, shit, I can't because- They get lost in the detail. They get lost in the detail, so- Well, they can't get finance. They can't mm-hmm. get the finance. Like, so, don't forget that. For every 100 people that want to buy, there's probably 50 that can't. They still want to mm. want to buy, but mm-hmm. they just can't. So if I'm listening to this how do, if I'm listening to this podcast, how do I go, yeah, I'm one of those 5%. That's me. It sounds like me. How do I do that assessment? I, I would probably take stock of what you already have and what your capacity is to go forward is the, yeah. is the very first thing. And when I mean go forward, have you got the capacity to be able to- hold that property for X amount of time, knowing that this is a long-term thing. And I know we always say that, but mm. bringing it back to Sydney, if you're getting in now, this is for the long term. You're just setting yourself up. How long the term's going to be? It's going to be back to Shane Oliver's thing in 24 years until you probably No, yeah, I, I don't think so. If you I, buy, it depends. If you're buying an off-plan apartment at Opal Towers, you might have to wait 100 <laughs> years for your thing to double, right? So it comes down to asset selection. Obviously. Side, so, side note, I thought of you the other day when I saw, I read the paper where uh, – there's all these unscrupulous vultures offering well, you thought them of me. Half, <laughs> yeah, straight up. <laughs> half price, you know, offering them half their purchase price in the Opal Towers. So I thought that's something that you would do. What, buy or sell? Buy at half yeah. price. You'd just be walking around there with your fish and chips feeding the pigeons saying, I'll give you I'll give you 50 cents in the dollar. <laughs> like a vulture. <laughs> like a, well. I'm going to buy all of Opal Tower. There you go. Buy the lot, sit on it for 10 years, 
And people will forget. People will forget. It'll get rectified <laughs> under insurance and people will forget. Well, no look doubt. at Lane Cove, right? You remember yeah. that, that tunnel when they're building the tunnel, the, the apartment yeah. collapsed. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the Blue people Mountains. People Fires go through there every yeah, 10 exactly. years. Yeah, yeah. people do. The floods, etc. cetera. But, um, so to be one of the 5%er, to be the 5%er, do you want to be one? What's the benefits of being one of the 5%? I, I just believe you get to set yourself now. Set yourself for what? For So you reckon you can... If you are smart over the next couple of years, you, you've got a bit of skin in the game already, a couple of properties, uh, and you take the right attitudinal approach to the city of Melbourne market and you have the capacity to do so, can you get yourself a 10-year head start on everyone else that would normally take that long to go? You, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do, and I would agree, yes. I would say yes. Mm. Um, there, there'll be the naysayers out there that say, yeah, but what about the opportunity cost now because your money's not really working hard for you it's not mm. growing? And the point there, or my answer to that, would be make sure you buy correctly to begin with. So I mentioned earlier on one of our trigger points and it, to, to find not to find the bottom of a market to purchase in it is something that's a little cosmetically challenged because it's it opens or you can take advantage of a very small slither of the market that other people can't because they can't get finance. Uh, so therefore they don't want to do the renovations. Or firstly. they don't have the skill set. They don't have the skill set. Or if you're a first homeowner or maybe an upgrader, you you've only just got enough capital to get a 90% loan, let alone then do a renovation. So it's a small window of opportunity. Yeah. So and you then, get the uplift on manufacturing equity. Manufacturing so that hasn't equity. It hasn't changed at all, yep. Victor. No, yeah. no. Yeah. And so so you, you're then protecting your deposit in a, in a market that's trending downwards because you're forcing the value up by doing the cosmetic renovation. So it all comes back, regardless of what market it is, whether it is a buyer's market, seller's market, flat market, it comes back to the asset selection and the strategy you employ to protect your money and uh, understand that it is very easy to get into a property. It's substantially harder to get out because there's enormous cost involved, stamp duties, selling costs, buying costs. Um, so you need to factor all of those in and look at it not from, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to get into this property um, because, you know, that's what this podcast said or that's what the market's telling me uh, and not doing your sums correctly. So if there's going to be an imminent change in your financials, you've got to take all of that into account when you're doing your asset selection so that it doesn't come back and bite you. Just because the opportunity is there doesn't mean that it's suitable for you. You need to analyze whether it's suitable for you, whether it fits into your plan, whether it fits into what's happening uh, financially. Are you losing a job? Are you starting self-employment? Are you going from self-employment back to PAYG? Have you got masses of equity, but you cannot borrow at all? Uh, you need to take stock of all of those things before you jump in. Okay, so I've listened to this and I've gone, that all sort of makes sense. I'm, I'm ready to make that mindset shift to be positive about this particular market rather negative at this particular market. Look for the opportunities. Great. Big tick. What do I do next? What do I do? Get finance ready first. Okay, first thing. First thing. Speak to someone. Mm -hmm. yeah, you could have all the want in the world, but if you can't get finance, yep. well, you just can't get finance. So, so it's just dis discount everything was said if you can't get finance. doesn't matter. Exactly. You're tapped out. Property investing is all about finance, nothing else. If you can't get the finance, you can have the best late plans. It'll it won't get you anywhere. Okay, so let's say you can get finance. You got a broker says that whatever bank will give you a pre-approval up to four hundred grand, five hundred grand. I don't know what you need in Sydney now. We're obviously, only need three hundred and fifty, right? To get in some places, eighty-eight. What happens then? I think you take stock of what you've already got. Look for the the type of property, wherever yeah. that may be, that suits your not just your financial position, but where you want to be. But you're saying, okay, you got to match the right property to your particular set of circumstances. But what are you guys actually like? If, if you know, for, for your um, your typical client, I know you don't really have a typical client because they're all from all walks of life. But what sort of assets are you liking right now? Which areas, houses, units? Give me something. Come on, Steve. Give me something. It um, he's needy, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, right, Jesus. Oh. Just a struggling journalist trying to get some, guy. Try, with, try, his lo with his long neck. <laughs> try, trying to get some some quality information out of a couple um, of mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> give us something, Steve. Come on. I'll give you something. Come on. Um, look, I would. Blonde brick houses out no, south west no. suburb of Sydney. No. No. I, well, yes, in some okay. circumstances, All but right. I, we still like Brisbane. I still like certain parts of Adelaide. And I still like certain parts, or we're beginning to like certain parts of WA, Perth in particular. Mm. I think Melbourne CBD, as we've been saying for some time, is cooked and it's six months behind Sydney. Yeah. Um, some of the outer, we'll call them regional areas perhaps of, of uh, Melbourne, have still got some legs. But what you're trying to get out of me is where is Sydney? <laughs> it's, um, and I think that depends on your budget. 
I think there's opportunity in Point Piper. Um, and your lazy fifty million lying around, I reckon you could pick someone you, up. You know, if you've got it, yeah, there's some money to be made. But there's also money to be made. I think, or sorry, some good value purchasing with potential, all the way down the other um, side of the scale. Okay. Well, if you, if you look at stats right now, no right, units. So, sorry, no units throughout Sydney. Yeah, don't touch. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Un- unless uh, unless you get it fifty percent in Opal Tower, yeah. of course. Yeah. So, mm. um, and if you look at stats right now, so let's let's take Melbourne as an example. In the last three months, it's gone down by 12.5% in the higher bracket. So I'm talking you're you're closer to the city. Mm. Um, And that's been the highest drop in the last, I think, from memory, 12 years. That it's been year on uh, in any three month, sorry, highest drop ever since they started taking stats. Okay. Right? So um, 12.5%. But if you go out to the affordable areas, the drop has only been 1%. The mortgage belt. The mortgage belt. Where yeah. Australia lives. Exactly right, yeah. yeah. So um, if you play that out, what's really happened? Um, we have lost confidence in our expenditure or our discretionary spending because the hype in in the general media is that you know, it's doom and gloom. Um, businesses are contracting. You've got people that, that, are, that are thinking, hang on, I can't spend this money. Um, and and uh, it's got a knock-on effect where people aren't as buoyant and they're not paying over the tops that the giggle money's going out where, and, and you get, get that natural contraction in the higher-priced properties. When you go to the affordable areas, your mortgage belt a- areas, your contraction isn't as great. Generally, when you have a market that cools, it cools from the inner going out and then it rebuilds from the out going back in. And, and that's, that's basically, you know. It's the, the new new. It's the new new, But yeah. I think, and one of the big things also is people just can't get the finance. That's right, yeah. For, so, uh, the, for $1.4 million, yeah, million dollars exactly. or a million dollars now, because those same people might have mm-hmm. another investment property elsewhere or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So if you can't get the finance, you can't get the finance. Absolutely. And the worst case scenario is if the the share market or the, or the confidence in the share market, therefore executive money, corporate money, and that trickle down effect mm-hmm could severely affect the upper end of the market as well because not only have you got a finance problem, a confidence problem, then you've got a double whammy of confidence because yep. there's the potential job loss and that's not even taking into account the price of money. True. <laughs> and let's let's play that out a little bit more in, in terms of uh, affordability. You said people can't get finance in the, in the higher price bracket as opposed to the affordable areas. It all comes back to yield. So, you know, a, a million and a half uh, property is um, probably sitting at about 2% yield, if that sometimes even lower. Whereas if you go to the 500 and below bracket, more than likely, and, and if I talk particularly uh, Melbourne and Sydney, you're getting above 4% yields in those areas. So mm. it's easier to qualify for the finance. There's less shortfall at the end of the day to hold onto that property. Shortfall being the difference between the money coming in, the money going out. Pre-tax. Uh, pre-tax, yep. Mm. And, and equally importantly, uh, you mentioned, Steve, in terms of shares, people dwelling into shares, right? So when, when the market in a, is in a boom phase, you get a lot of people using their equity to start businesses, to, to um, dwell into shares and, and get into ventures, right? So whether it is businesses, um, uh, investment schemes in inverted commas and so forth. As the market contracts, that sentiment reduces and, and you can hear the headline of people are retreating to the safe haven of property mm. because it's stable. It, it can be, if you're able to hold on to it, it doesn't, unless unless you've got the fundamentals horribly wrong and you bought out in whoop whoop in, in a mining town, the fundamentals will come through and, and your stability will will return. You're you're in the money again as far as paper trail goes. It it comes back to again buying and being able to hold on for the long term. Well this is the wealth effect because everything's mm. on paper until you actually buy sell or it. sell. Yeah, exactly. So it's only what's between your ears. Mm. Okay. So some specifics there and imagine You've got a bit more on your website, Victor. Where can people go to learn more about where you guys are investing at the moment? Sure. They can uh, go to rightpropertygroup.com.au okay. or uh, they can reach out to us directly on questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Okay, excellent. So questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. And actually, you've set me up nicely for a segue into a question how, of the month. I'll give you the segue. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It's for, do, we, do we say last names on questions? I'm not using the initial. Mark T. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, appreciate you uh, writing in two questions at Right Property Group. So we do this uh, every time we get together. We just try and uh, answer, well, we do answer a question from uh, one of our listeners. And by the way, you're, you're part of a very large community who are tuning into Investing Insights uh, with the Right Property Group. So uh, we do appreciate uh, you getting in touch. And this is a two-way dialogue. Um, we want to know what you guys think. So um, please do write in and we will get around to your questions. And uh, as we get more of them, we might have been uh, answer a few more. But um, this question from uh, Mark T. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it, so I'm going to get it right off the cuff. It says, uh, hi, guys. Uh, thanks for your awesome podcast. He's probably not talking about you there, Steve. Awesome. Did you say that? Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, <laughs> it's just you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your awesome podcast. Uh, loving the info and research you guys put out to us listeners. Exclamation point. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I'm an experienced property loser. That, having That's you. Probably, <laughs> probably loser. Having bought a dud and now fixing my errors and educating myself through people like yourself. Much appreciated. I have a question regarding to the property manager selection and getting their help on an investment property. I haven't been able to get the secrets or killer questions to get all the good info from the property managers regarding why I should use them, how they differ from others and what value they bring to the investment team and tenant selection. How do you decide which property uh, firm slash manager to use and how do you work with them and manage your property with their help? Uh, thanks for the answer and your help, kind regards, Mark. So I'd kick it off saying um, a good property manager doesn't see you as a customer. They see you as an asset manager. They're there to look after your asset. So I put that first and foremost, but you guys cover a lot of ground here. Mm. Steve, what would be the sort of three or four – uh, filters that we, you would use to at least consider a particular property manager, point number one. And then, Victor, I'm going to turn to you and say when you actually talk to a property manager, what do you ask them? So mm-hmm. how do you how do you get your shortlist together, Steve? My shortlist is how many property managers per 100 properties Okay, uh, because you don't want to be too thin uh, because as a result of that trickle-down effect is communication – Routine inspections, they can't be stretched, otherwise your asset You're not going to be able to find that out, though, when you're trying to shortlist someone. Yeah, I, I, oh, yeah, you, so you, you do them. that. So, so do, Okay, let's go to the process. So I bought a property in X. How do I work out- How big's your rent roll is my first question. Before I actually speak to them. How do I sort of work out who I'm going to talk to? Oh, well, one of the- for, Well, that's a stupid for, question because there's only a three or four people who can potentially do it. No, no, it's, yeah. not, it's not a stupid question this time. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, one of the things like the four. I really like the culture of this podcast and where it's going. It's getting yeah. better and better. So uh, you, you guys set the standard. I'm just, I'm just here. I'm just trying to sort of be part of a community, like a conversation here. But if that's the way you want to play it, I'm very I'm only, comfortable operating in those environments. I'm only, so. I'm only reacting. Okay, all right. <laughs> Is that uh, things escalate? Sorry. The, yeah, they do. Wait till yeah. we stop recording. Look out. Um, I, I, the internet forums are, are a good, great place to start yep. because everybody uh, has a keyboard opinion. Mm. Uh, the second thing is I jump onto the the website, so realestate.com, domain or whatever it may be, and who seems to be having the most listings because usually they are the bigger player in town. So automatically potential tenants will go to whoever's got the most signboards yeah, as well as who's got the right house. Uh, and then I can ring them up and – Ask how big is their, how many properties do they manage, and how many property managers they have, and how many property offices they have, and that's um, uh, important that you say those two words. The one thing I don't ask, however, is uh, how much do they cost. That's my last question because mm. you pay for what you get, and before that, of course, is how many routines inspection, how many routines inspections do I have? Have you got any other people I can speak to to talk about the feedback and their their experience with you, uh, longevity? Are they a name brand? There's a lot of questions. Name brand matter? Um, not so much as in if it's one of the big franchises mm. as opposed to a very small startup that doesn't have the infrastructure yet. Okay. All right. So one of the things, uh, Steve, you forgot to mention, which, which we do regularly, is when we selecting the property, it boils down to that as well. So we, one of the key things we look at is how many property managers are there in the area? You know, Are you stuck with just the one so if you're talking regional as an example, are you stuck with just the one or two? So you've got the best of the bad bunch in there. The other thing that, that we do uh, is before we ask those questions, Steve, if you, um, uh, we mystery shop them. So we become a tenant 
when we apply for a property, so make an inquiry on a property to see how quickly they come back to us. Mm. And then the second thing we do is obviously we we um, inquire in terms of, okay, I've got a property to, to rent out. Uh, can someone talk to me? And, and depending on how long they take and what their process is to get back to, to us, determines whether they, they get onto the short list to begin with. Which is all part of the communication. Yep. Mm. And the other the other bit thing is how heavy are you on maintenance, Mr. Property Manager? Because a lot of property managers tend to look after the tenant more so than the landlord. Not a lot, some. And that shows through with the amount of maintenance requests that you get and the yeah. perhaps the pressure that you have from them to complete that maintenance and repairs. Now, I'm not suggesting you be a slumlord no. uh, and that you should always take care of Certain repairs and maintenance. I think property managers, <clears throat> it, it is the hardest job that is around. Yeah, and the easiest way to get the workload off their desk, because you think about it, you're getting smashed by landlords, smashed by tenants. The easiest way to get the workload off your desk is to get the landlord to say yes mm-hmm. uh, to, to everything. Yeah. So so this goes to the, the question around how do you know you've got a, a good property manager? So you, you spoke about questions to actually help choose, but if you choose someone, how do you know they're performing for you? And, and I have in, in my portfolio – some property managers who some people think were excellent property managers, but I find them highly, highly, highly irritating and annoying. They oh, because because they contact you. Every day, <laughs> yeah. every day saying, saying uh, oh, X, Y, Z isn't working anymore. And I said, yeah. okay, I just don't care. I'm not going to fix it. I you know, know. I think I know. Just, yeah, about, yeah, yeah. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Some people think that like highly diligent, you know, focused, give a shit, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, on the other side, it's going, a fine line. It's a fine line. So, so how do you work out? whether someone's good or not, or how do you work out when you go, you know what, they're okay, it's too hard to change, it'll do, life moves on. Sometimes you just got to suck it and see. And so if if you really are up in the air and you want to find out whether they are worthy of managing your property for the long term, then enter an agreement with them once you've got all those other little bits and pieces out of the way. But instead of having a a, a 12-month contract with them or a six-month contract, but more importantly, a two-month divorce divorce court um, scenario where you want to leave them, Make sure that it's, you know, I, I personally like 14 days mm. if I can get them to do it, if mm. not 21, because when I, when I want out, I want out now. Yeah. yeah. It's not like- So it's got to go, so it's got to go pretty wrong to, to change property managers, right? You don't change them willy nilly, right? There's got to be some, something substantially- Some do, and yeah. but it's usually around rate. Yeah. So price largely is irrelevant if it's like a 0.5% difference, you know, what are you really talking about? Maybe five, 10 bucks a it's, week? Yeah, it's know? not so much that. It's, it's the little- the add-ons. It's the add-ons and the hidden add-ons. And a, and a really mm. good one that I often talk about is- the difference between, let's just say it was 7% is the management fee. Yeah. Yeah, 7% plus GST of all monies collected or rent collected. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's it's a, a really big thing, right? It's a big thing. Um, so like relisting fees, marketing fees. So, so water play, collection play, fees. Play out, yeah. 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 So your yeah, water fee. That's a, water big, fees. that's a big one, that. Yeah. yeah. Big one. And it's only one word difference. Yeah. And yeah. also the insurance payout. So if you've got an insurance payout, they'll take a clip off that as yeah, well. Yeah, or even organize mm-hmm. the insurance. So there's a lot of those little add-ons. So you don't want to be ripped, but you want to, pay a fair amount for a, for a hard job. I think it's a good point. We've covered a lot. We're going to have to wind up, but can you guys write a piece for us on Absolutely. that? Yeah, put yep. it on, 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 on the website. Because mm-hmm. I think people, you know, and I, re- I break it down like that. This is this is how you do your initial filter to work out who you're going to talk to. This is when you talk to them, what questions do you ask? And then how do you know you got a good one or not? Mm-hmm. And I think that'd be really good, but I think we don't going to be able to go too much more into it. It's good though. Uh, yeah. Do we answer it? Yeah. No, it's going to be online. Victor's going to write an article. He's going to give more Wasn't details. He, well, you, he you were supposed to write an article. Yeah, but you were supposed to write an article last time. Did you do that? Yeah, I did. What Don't was it about? It I have no idea what it was, though. Okay. <laughs> the, the one point I would make, just uh, so if you're tuning into this and working out why the by the property manager should be working on behalf of you rather than the tenant. Yes, they should be looking after the tenant. Most of the value in a real estate business it's, is its rent role. So it's really, really important for a property manager if they secure you as a client that they want to keep you as a client. So keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, you've you got to be fair. You don't want to be slumlord. You've got your duty of care and responsibilities as a landlord to ensure that you provide a safe uh, environment for someone to live, but you know it gets a bit grey in the middle there, where you don't want to do absolutely everything. So, you know, uh, depending on the property or whatever, you know, mm. new air conditioning, new this, new that. Sometimes you just go, no, nah, it's not going to happen. So that's a skill. And but- maybe when you're mm-hmm. writing this article, Victor, which you'll have done by next Wednesday, it um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe mention also the potential new law changes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, okay, I think that's, that cool. is, that's a good one. 
So uh, uh, thanks, Mark T. I uh, hope we helped you out with that. But uh, as Victor has committed to. Committed, uh, that's the word. Committed, uh, rightpropertygroup.com.au. Go and check it out. I'm going to look at the traffic on this to see how popular you are, Victor. See if anyone actually wants Ooh, to the pressure's on. read any of your articles. I'll send you a writing. I know you've got a book these days, so you've you've practised you've practiced sort of writing out 10,000 words or whatever else. And, and I'm going to leave on that. How's it all going? Is it's it going fine well. off the shelves? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It, it is going well. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, a fair few requests from uh, the last podcast as well. Okay. So if someone wants to get access to the book, go to the last podcast. Uh, you've got a link there. Uh, and a discount code that you can um, uh, that you can apply. A okay. discount code. Discount code. That went out on the 22nd of February. So that podcast was called Why Investing in a Hot Spot is Not Always Kind of Read My Writing. The Right Move. There we go. I've got it there. That was Don't forget to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a copy. You gave it to me, but you didn't sign it. No, no that, that, I did. That's, I did. That, that's extra. Is it? Yeah, okay. signing is extra. I want to sign a copy, you know. <laughs> Especially I, for you, Phil. I collect as my hobbies, collecting property <laughs> investment books. <laughs> Anyway, I enjoy it's, the chat today, guys. It is. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, from reputable authors, right? Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> and then there's Victor Kumar. <laughs> <laughs> the final sledge. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get the last pot shot in, but uh, thank you very much, guys. That was really informative. You've, you've made me just reaffirm my mindset and my attitude towards the current market. I'm looking for the opportunities. I'm not looking for the reasons why I shouldn't be investing. I should be, I'm looking at why. I am investing and why I'm looking to invest right now. So uh, if you can take that away from this chat, I think you're doing quite well. But as we've as we've outlined, it's probably only a very small percentage of people who are right for this particular market. I'd like to think the fact that you're listening to a property investment podcast means that you're up there as someone a bit more sophisticated, educated, and driven. Uh, so you're down the right path. But um, you know, you need to lean on the relevant people that you use as your property A team to ensure that you are making the right moves. And as Victor said, it starts with getting finance. So uh, any questions that anyone's got around this, can they speak to you guys? Are you happy to absolutely just, yeah. just reach out to us on questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Okay, we'll 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 uh, have a chat. Nice one. So uh, I do enjoy these guys once a month. Um, it's uh, one of the highlights that I have because uh, it gets me out of my desk and doing stuff and chatting to you guys and. Gets him, gets him out of his desk, sitting on a park bench, feeding him. Yeah, yeah, it does. Out. There we go. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your time. Awesome. See you. Okay. We'll be back in next time. Until then, bye bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs, and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.